volcano that's not really well known to many, many people. And especially now that the memory of the big eruption in 1991 is largely faded. And even at the time, people wondered, what volcano? Where is that crazy? And what I want to do in a very short time is just to introduce you how this volcano came back to life after being quiet for more than 600 years or more and caused the biggest eruption in the world since 1912. And the focus of my talk this evening will be, what was the situation before 1991? What did people know about Pekin Temple? And so what? And what was going on at that time with the volcano? And then to summarize very, very briefly the eruption itself, but particularly I want to focus on the response to the eruption. Yes, it was a big eruption to call all kinds of damage, but how did the scientists respond? How did the emergency management officials respond? How did the people respond to a volcano that came back to life after 600 years? And then the impact of the eruption, and, and a little bit about this is a really feel-good story for volcanologists. We don't always do things right, but we, on this one, I like to think that the volcanologists there on site, making the studies and making the interpretation, did things right and literally saved many, many, many thousands of lives. Because this eruption was huge, but given its size, it caused relatively few fatalities. Okay, just to set the context for the volcano that's closer by here, I, I've shown here in these circles, which are proportional to the volume of the large eruptions, or eruptions that are well known. And here we see Mount St. Helens, you know, it was only one cubic kilometer. Here's Pinatubo, 10 times that. Here's Noah Rutland, Katmai, up in Alaska, which was, or is, the largest eruption in the world in the 20th century. And Tambora Volcano in Indonesia is the world's largest historical eruption in recorded history. However, you will see by these much larger circles, including the three big eruptions from Yellowstone, these historical eruptions in historical time are tiny compared to what, what has happened in the geological past. And I'll kind of loop back to this later. But just sort of keep that in mind, even though all of the historical eruptions are down here, and the prehistoric eruptions or can be much, much bigger. Okay, so where is Pinatubo? Uh, I think some of you have heard about the, the, the circumvisiting ring of fire, which is the zone of volcano and earthquakes that basically encircle the Pacific Basin. And the, the Philippine Islands are here, the Philippine Trench. And so it's part of the circumvisiting ring of fire. This is where 80, 90 percent of all the world's earthquakes and volcanic eruptions occur. A little closer up, it shows the plate tectonics setting. We have the Philippine Sea Plate, the Eurasia Plate, and the Pacific Plate. And here are the Philippine Islands. And the blow up of that, it shows Manila, which is a huge metropolitan area with over 15 million people, probably. <coughs> Island Luzon, you've got two prominent volcanoes in that area. We've got Pinatubo, now it's very prominent. It wasn't then, back in 1991, and Mayong. Okay, that looks like a volcano, right? I mean, it's a classic stratovolcano. You know, symmetrical, conical, and this is Mayong. And it's the, the most active volcano in the Philippines with more than 60 historical eruptions. And most recently in 2013. Now most of these are relatively small. But they're not on the scale of Pinatubo by any means. But they keep, they keep the people aware that the volcano is around. And you can see the, all the fresh flows and, and the very rich rice fields here. Are, are volcanic ash, which, which are very, very, very fertile for, for, for 
the volcanoes and Bryce kind of go together. Now, okay, here we see, before 1991, a picture of Pinatubo. Yeah, you can see it's kind of a big, ragged, irregular bunch of mountains. And Pinatubo just barely sticks up above the surrounding mountains. And it just doesn't look like, much like an active volcano. And what you see in the foreground here are very deeply eroded ash flows, pyroclastic deposits, from big eruptions that have happened in the geological past. There are no historical eruptions before 1991, but gigantic eruptions have occurred in the geological past, and most recently, about 600 years ago. Uh, this was known as a geothermal, or a potential geothermal development site. Uh, a lot of interest back in that time, back in the 80s and 90s, but nothing came of it, it was not economic. And from the 1991 eruption, the, the height of the, oops, of the volcano was lowered by about 260 meters. It blew the top off. Okay, so a very brief chronology here. The Philippine government has, all, has always classified their volcano into two groups, inactive and active, for various reasons. And in the Early 1980s, Pinatubo was still classified as an inactive volcano. It had been quiet for so long that people said, oh, well, it's probably dormant now, maybe extinct even. But then they had a few radiocarbon dates, just a few. They didn't do many studies, but some of them were about 600 years ago. And based on that, the, the scientists and the government <coughs> decided to change on their map or their category of volcanoes made Pinatubo active rather than inactive. Then, starting in early March 1991, there was increased steaming around these fumarole fields of the old geothermal development site. And then some earthquakes started to hit, small ones that were felt by the local people in mid-March. And that prompted a, some study by the Philippine scientists who then asked for the U.S. Geological Survey for help. And USGS VDAP, and I'll talk about VDAP a little bit more. We arrived, or the VDAP team arrived in late April to help our colleagues in the Philippines. And then the first steam blast explosions began on April 2nd. So in a very short time, a few weeks of ramping up, things started coming out of the ground. What we call steam blasts or phreatic explosions. And then this continued until the lava dome, the magma, finally got to the surface and extruded the formal lava dome in, at the summit of the volcano. So this was the first sort of transition from the steam blast type activity to truly magmatic type volcanic activity. Then, a, then these then became very, very large, starting on June 12th, very, very huge explosions, and then the climactic eruption occurred on June 15th. So that's kind of a very quick rundown on how it built up. Now, some people have speculated that, well, what woke up this old volcano that had been quiet for so many centuries? And there's been some speculation that maybe a large earthquake in the region about a year before might have jarred things loose or activated the whole tectonic system. But that can't ever really be proved. But it, it's possible, but there's no way of getting back at it now. Did it really reawaken the system or not? Or was it coincidental? We don't know that, but, but some people have actually postulated that that was a possibility. Now, VDAP, okay. It's alphabet soup here a little bit. Volcano Disaster Assistance Program. And this is jointly funded by the USGS and the State Department through USAID, their Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. And that whole program was developed after a major volcanic tragedy in 1985 at a volcano in Colombia called the Vado del Ruiz, where you had 25,000 people killed, basically because of miscommunication between the scientists and the officials. It should not have happened, but it did. 
There were scientific warnings. The warnings were not acted upon. Anyway, in response to that, the USGS began this program of basically what you might call it a SWAT team. You know, if something is going around the world, and if we're asked through official channels, through the embassies, for assistance, we send our SWAT team. And these guys are ready to go within a week's notice. They have all the equipment packaged up that can be put on commercial airliners, no special uh, equipment assembly or anything. They just go pack up and go and try to help out. And it's been helping out in quite a few different responses since its formation in 1986. And this map here shows where quite a few of the volcanoes around the world where we've helped out. And in some cases, it's just a little bit of help. In other cases, like the Peter Tugel situation, we've actually had a very major role in helping our Filipino colleagues. Well, okay. Well, that sounds pretty straightforward and simple, but, but then you have to deal with reality. And in 1991, at that time, when the volcano started showing signs of coming back to life, there was a lot of skepticism. People just didn't, didn't believe it or didn't want to believe it. And, and here are a bunch of headlines saying, you know, uh, Clark Air Base, you know, and, and Filipinos say Americans re overreact to the volcano. A lot of disbelief, you know, this, you know, this is all kind of just being hyped up for, for various other reasons other than safety of the people. And there was some other interesting things going on. In 1991, there was a major renegotiation for U.S. military bases, Clark Air Base, Subic Bay Naval Station. The leases on those bases had expired. They were being renegotiated. And people on both sides of the issue were saying, ah, this volcano, you're just making a big deal out of it to strengthen your arguments. And that was a complication for us. And then we have this other thing here. The Beards Factor. Now, probably a lot of you in the audience that are probably ex-military might appreciate that. So we have a bunch of scruffy bearded geologists going head-to-head -head with four-star generals, commandant air bases, to try to explain what's going on. Look, General, we think this is a serious situation. And they see one of these guys and say, oh, yeah, get out of here. But anyway, so that was something we had to deal with. And we did. Now, here's some other complications at the time. The, there were some guerrillas, the New People's Army, who controlled Pinatubo, who controlled the volcano. And they, they, they didn't trust anybody. They thought that anybody flying around in a helicopter, especially the military one, had to be the enemy. So, so we were suspect from the get-go. And then there were a bunch of aboriginal peoples who live on the volcano, Aitas, who basically don't trust anybody at sea level. So anybody coming up on their mouth can't be, can't be trusted, other than a few nuns. So this was kind of the context we came into. I mean, not only our Filipino colleagues, but the USGS people, part of this team, who were sent to help out. OK, well, here's a view on April 1, showing the, the uh, mountain. And you see some fumarolic areas, that's always been there. That was, that was part of the reason for trying to tap the geothermal energy there. There was some heat below the ground. And then, the next day after that previous picture, the steam blast explosions began, or phreatic activity began. And this was the first activity. There were some explosions that came from a series of small crater vents here that blasted out material. And you can see there's ash being blanketed around the area. But these were relatively small. And it didn't hurt anybody or didn't kill anybody at the time. But it did get everybody's attention that the volcano had come back to life. And there's another view of the steaming area and the early activity. What I mean by phreatic is, there's no molten rock, no magma had been erupted yet. These are just explosions of older solid volcanic rock from the steam pressure. So magma was trying to work its way up, but none of it actually got to the surface of the 
interrupted yet. Okay, here's some of our bearded friends. Uh, Philox is the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, our principal counterparts. And this shows some of our people working with their people to start beginning installing a monitoring network of seismometers, tilt meters, instruments to measure the, the, the volcanic gas. Because this volcano hadn't been studied before, but unmonitored. No information about it. Not like Yellowstone here or Mount St. Helens or Hawaii or anything like that. There's no observatory there at all. Unknown. And they had to do everything by helicopter support, bringing in antenna, instruments, radio equipment, and so on, to put in a seismic network of seven stations. That's, you know, that was enough to do the job, and it's obviously not enough to really do a great job. And here you see the, the people unloading equipment and with the volcano erupting in the background. And keeping in mind the activity started already. So you're working around these conditions and a little tense. You know, is it, is it going to get bigger or smaller as you're putting in the equipment? Here they're installing a tilt meter to measure ground deformation. We know now from studies around the world of volcanoes, they puff up before they, they explode or erupt and their instruments that can measure the amount of puffing up. Seismometers, these are pretty ancient techniques at that time. Uh, nowadays, everything is computerized a lot more, but this is what we had in those days, especially for portable equipment that you could bring to another country very quickly. And at the same time, while some of our people were putting in these monitoring stations, there were other people making a geological reconnaissance of the old deposits, which we knew to be ancient ash flows, but they, they started studying them and making measurements, collecting more charcoal for dating, and trying to do this in a very short time. We didn't know what the volcano was going to do. We didn't know how long the fuse was, or if there was going to be a fuse, even would it actually really erupt in a big way. Well, Based on a very, very quick study of the region around there, they, they very quickly confirmed that there was an immense amount of old pyroclastic flows. And here are the geologists down here for scale. But you can see these are hundreds of meters of piled up volcanic deposits that were explosively erupted. And they also had to do, at that time, based on very limited reconnaissance data, produce a hazards map that we could present to the officials, both civilian and the military. The Clark Air Base, Clark Air Base is only about 25 kilometers away from this volcano. And so they were very willing to provide us help in terms of helicopters and support. But here's the map, and it's very simple. You can't do something very, very fancy in, in a matter of days, and this is what they did. The circles are the seismic stations, the seismometers put in. The yellow area shows the areas that are very, very susceptible to pyroclastic flow. And I think you and the audience know what these things are. This is a sweeping cloud of hot ash and gas that can travel at hundreds of miles per hour that basically wipes out everything in its path. It burns it or suffocates it. It, it, it displaces the oxygen. So if you're in one of these pyroclastic flows, that's it. The only way to not be there, you have to get out of harm's way. Then, as is common in many, many volcanoes, you have uh, mud flows or lahar, which is the Indonesian term for it, down valley farther. So here you have the pyroclastic <laughs> flow hazard zone in yellow. The areas in, bl in blue basically follow the drainages down for many, many more tens of kilometers to the ocean, in fact. And so all of this was presented to the official by late May. You know, I mean, we think of scientists taking years and decades to, to, to work up a research project. Well, all of this stuff was done within weeks. It was just incredible pressure to get the data and get some information that we could help the officials. Um, here's just some data. I won't bore you with a lot of the details here, but 
for the measurement of sulfur dioxide, we used an instrument called COSPEC. And as you can show, it's, it's a pretty substantial amount of gas. There's metric tons per day. And the first measurements were made about the 12th of May. And then you can see it, it, it increases, increases, increases up to this point, and it decreases. Now, you might think, oh, it's decreasing. Everything's OK, we can go home now. No. Our people interpreted that to mean that meant that with more magma, the magma material was coming closer and closer to the surface that actually blocked the release of the gas, and that's why it started going down again. So that was a danger sign to us, not a good sign. And, oh my God, you know, there's, there's a lot more molten rock closer to the surface now. And the seismometers, the seismic data also indicated at about this time when this is going down, a very sharp increase in the amount of seismic energy release. Because we had a very crude network, this particular parameter, our say, is very useful. What it is, it's just a very simple indicator of the total amount of seismic energy that's been released without really much uh, information about the magnitude of the earthquake or how deep it is, because you don't have time to do that, and the network is not good enough to do that, really. Although we would get some of that data, but this was the most useful data. You could actually just see it in real time. Is the energy increasing or decreasing? And you, I think you can convince yourself here, a very sharp rise until you get to the big explosive eruption on June 12th. Well, now, we were, of course, able to locate the, the, uh, where the earthquakes occurred at depth. And this is a very simplified diagram from a lot of complicated ones, showing that from May to the buildup of the first big eruption on June 12th, the, there was a basic migration, and most of the seismicity here moved closer to the summit area and became <coughs> shallower. So this kind of information plus the, the seismic energy release data convinced our people that magma was indeed coming up closer to the surface, and of course we had the dome that came out on June 7th, which confirmed it for us. It's a similar plot here. You can see that on the 10th of June, there's a huge spike in the amount of SO2, and then the big, big explosive eruption on June 12th occurred. The first of these big explosions leading up to the biggest one. And there's the first, first picture of the dome, New lava that finally broke the surface on June 10th. With a similar plot again, but you can see that from the 12th on, as it built up to the, the, the climactic eruption, you can see there was another sharp increase in the seismic energy that after the big, big eruption, the climactic eruption, and it tailed off. Similar plot here, the, 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 you can see the RSAM, the total energy release values, really ramping up on the 14th until it finally, the biggest eruption on June 15th. And also there were more, more long period earthquakes rather than what we call tectonic earthquakes, which also is an indicator of the involvement of molten rock or magma. So what I've just showed you in very, very quick form is based on a lot more data than that, of course. But those kinds of relationships convinced the, the USG and the VDAP team and, the, and our Philippine counterparts that, that you know, magma was coming up. Something indeed was going to blow. And the, the variation in the sulfur dioxide variation increasing and then decreasing confirmed the rise in magma and the migration of the seismicity from one part of the volcano to right beneath where the steaming areas were at the summit. And the onset of long period seismic events also implied magma involvement. And finally, the big, big explosion run on June 12th. So all of these kind of factored into the forecast that we then relay to the officials that we seriously think that something's going to be going to happen probably within the next several days or a week or so. 
and that we strongly urge you to consider serious evacuations of the population around the volcano. And they did that. They set up a certain number of alert levels and the evacuations. Uh, level two just simply means is a is an eruption possible or not? What are the likelihood? You reach level two, yeah, we think there could be an eruption. Level three means an eruption within two weeks. Level four, within 24 hours. And level five is something actually in progress. And these are the, the evacuations that were actually ordered by the emergency management officials. This was just a temporary one because we didn't know, we didn't have any data at that time. We just said, well, let's evacuate people. Anybody within 10 kilometers of the volcano, get them out of there. And they did that. And then they actually went to level two, and they stuck with this evacuation radius of 10 kilometers. And then by the time they reached level four, they broadened it. The people living within 20 kilometers of the volcano better get out of there. We were anticipating something bigger. And finally, they actually went to level five on June 10th, which was a little bit premature. We were wrong on that because you know the, the biggest one really didn't happen until June 12. But that got people's attention. They, you know, then they started evacuating people 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers around the volcano, and that's a lot of people in that part of the world. Now, as part of this process, okay, so we get the scientific data. What do we do with it? We interpret it. We come up with some scenarios of what might happen. But then we have to explain it to officials who are non-scientists. We have to explain to mayors and commandants of military bases on what the heck is going on. And how do you do this? Especially for people living on a volcano who've been quiet for 600 years. And the team used a, a draft version, it wasn't completed yet, of this video put out by the International Association of Volcanology that very vividly and graphically portraying all the gruesome things that can happen to a human being in a building, from an ash flow to ash fall, the volcanic gases and mud flows and so on. You don't need much, you don't need too many words to convince them this is a bad place to be, to not be involved with one of these processes. And unfortunately, the guy, Maurice Kraft, who was ultimately the producer of this, he and his wife, were actually killed at a volcanic eruption in Japan, Unzen, three days before Pinatubo <laughs> came alive. So it's kind of ironic. But we used this draft copy, and we used it very successfully to convince people that this is serious, you better do something. And the, the team itself called itself the Pinatubo Observatory, you know, with a little shack here on Clark Air Base. And they decided on June 10th, even before the biggest eruption on June 12th, that, you know, we're a little too close here. You know, the, the, the volcano here is only about 20 kilometers away. And, you know, they didn't want to evacuate first because they had to tend to the store. But they decided, well, let's move five kilometers this way. That's smart. Let's do it. But that had the, 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 the unintended effect of convincing the commandant at the air base got those signs that are getting out. We better get our tails on <laughs> so, And some scenes of the, and, and literally nearly 300,000 people were evacuated in a matter of a week or so, both from Clark Air Base, which had 40,000 people, you know, fit the servicemen and dependents, their families, and all of the, the civilians around all the villages around the volcano. And this picture is interesting. Okay, this is the first big, big eruption on June 12th. Here's this huge thing going up about, you know, 15, 16 kilometers into the air. And here's this farmer with his carabao still blowing the field. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he didn't care. Apparently, he didn't feel, oh, I'm far enough away or whatever. Okay. Now, this is actually a picture of an advancing pyroclastic flow. So just kind of picture this thing coming towards you. It's probably a few hundred degrees centigrade in temperature. It displaced all oxygen. It'll burn everything in its path. 
And this guy is driving like heck to get out of there. <laughs> but, but that's what these things look like. And they move at very high speeds. And there's nothing to do to stop them. The only thing to do is to get out of there and be evacuated. Uh, I thought you might get a kick out of these. OK, now keep in mind that Clark Air Base has already received a lot of ash from the June 12 eruption. So you see all the ash on the buildings and stuff and on top of the sign. Well, they're going to have the last days of Pompeii as a play on June 14, and a Father's Day brunch, ugly tie contest on June 16. Well, after getting that ash from the June 12 eruption, they canceled it. And there's some of the ash from June 12 on, on, on a newspaper stand. Mount Pinatubo Sowers Clark. And then, to, to, to really to, to top it all off, there was a typhoon approaching the Philippines at the same time that the biggest eruption on June 15th was going on. It literally turned the skies dark, falling ash, and here's the sign for Clark Air Base. And, of course, that made all the ash wet. And wet ash is much more destructive than dry ash on roofs and buildings and structures. It's a combination of bad, bad things going on. Okay, Here, here's just a very quick summary map of the, the distribution of pyroclastic deposits shown here in the Pink and the, and the lahars, the mud flows that went down all of the tributaries draining the volcano. Uh, just to show a little bit, here's 20 kilometers. You can see that these things went a long way and they caused damage all the way down, of course. And I'll show you some scenes of the damage from that. And in the process of that big eruption on June 15th, a new crater was formed two kilometers wide, and literally blew 250 meters off the top of the volcano. And one of the valleys flanking the, the volcano, the Barilla Valley, was buried by 200 meters of pyroclastic flow, ash flows. I mean, that's just burying the entire valley. So had you been living in the valley, not so good. Here's some ash flanking uh, Clark Air Base. Some collapsed warehouses from the wave of wet ash. And this is Subic Bay, which is 40 kilometers away, which happened in a downwind direction. And you can see there's a lot of ash being dumped And, of course, all of the surrounding small villages got ash and, and uh, mudflow damage, too. And here's one of these Nipa huts, you know, with the Filipinos, villagers. You can see the ash damage for that. Here's a church that's two-thirds buried by a lahar. So that's, a, that's about, you know, a, another five, six meters Okay, now, this is an interesting pair of pictures. I mean, this one here shows a photo on 23rd of July. And keep in mind this building with the arrow. And here's some people for scale. Okay, that's after several mud flows have swept through, and that's what's visible of the building. So in many ways, the the damage and destruction from the eruption itself, the ash fall, the pyroclastic flows, pales by comparison to the destruction by the Lahars. Here's a Kubi point, a plane. It just got too much ash on its tail. It got tipped up. Okay, here's a satellite image of the, of the big eruption. Now, I won't dwell on the details here, but it just shows it's starting to spread westward from Luzon. And here's a satellite instrument, the Nimbus, showing the, the migration of the <coughs> ash cloud drifting westward. And in a matter of a week or so, it had encircled the, the whole world. 
Now, Pinatubo put out a lot of volcanic gas during that eruption. And this is a diagram, and I won't bore you with the details here, showing the various volcanic eruptions since 1979. And Pinatubo tops the list as being the biggest sulfur dioxide producer in this amount of time when measurements had been made. Here I actually compare the, the amount of total rock material put out. You can see Mount St. Helens is a pipsqueak, only about one. El Chichon in Mexico, only about one. The Pinatubo is about 10 times both of those. And, but the amount of sulfur varies greatly. El Chichon was incredibly sulfur rich. I mean, he's had so much sulfur in the magma for some reason that it actually formed something called anhydrite, which is a sulfate of, of calcium, as a primary phenocrist phase in the rock, in, in the volcanic glass. And at Mount Pinatubo, you also have trace amounts of it, much less. But here's the difference. It was 19 megatons of SO2, which is almost three times that of LG Chum. So it was the biggest producer of SO2 in recent decades. And I hope my, my friend Peter Ward had given talks on that whole climate impact, and I won't get into that thing. That's a whole separate talk. Now, when you have these drifting volcanic clouds of ash and aerosols at stratospheric levels where jet liners fly, you know, your, your commercial airliners will fly at those elevations and they'll run into those. So here we have a, oops, sorry. Here we see the number of encounters between commercial aircraft flying into volcanic clouds. You can see from 1970 on, there was a, quite a few around Mount St. Helens, El Chichon, Mexico, quite a few, but look at Mount Pinatubo. Because of the amount of junk put into the air, there's just more junk for the airliners to run into. And here's the, the aerosol layer was actually photographed by the astronauts aboard the space shuttle. You can see, it seems a very, if it were a, a pristine atmosphere, you would not see that dark band on top at all. And the effect of this actually lowered global temperatures by half to 0.6 degrees centigrade uh, around the world, in the Northern Hemisphere in particular. And this effect of the eruption on climate lasted for several years before finally dissipating. And this particular eruption caused the largest stratospheric aerosol event since 1883. <coughs> So it was a big deal, it was a big deal. Okay, Lahar damage. Now take a look at this aerial view of this. Here's a bridge knocked out by a sleeping Lahar. And you know, people are pretty clever. You know, well, they built little catwalks and things, and they still were able to cross the river. And here's another bridge knocked out by the, by the mud flows. And you can see the vehicles fording the stream. You still have to get to work, I guess, or, or do something. And so you catch your local bus going to the village. Now, this is really interesting. Uh, compare the top picture. This is this valley that was buried by 200 meters of pyroclastic materials. This is 1991. And by 1994, this is what it looked like. There's the same point for reference, and nearly all of that had been eroded away by later lahars. And I want to make a distinction here between primary lahars, those that actually occur during the eruption itself, by coming down the river channels and mixing with water and all of the loose stuff, and those that are actually produced by monsoon rains, torrential <coughs> rains, which Philippines can, can receive. So you've got all this loose material that's unconsolidated. You 
you get a great big storm and it just sluices it all down. And that's what's going, it, it takes the stuff from here and dumps it downstream. Now here's another aerial view. This is uh, 1994, this little village, Bacolor, was just starting to, to recover from the 1991-1992. And then another big resurgence from secondary Lahar, rain-induced Lahars, and put them right back to where they were before they, they recovered. And this one we're really get to here, the same village, Here's this gas station in 1991, flooded with, with some Lahar materials in the gas station. And they cleaned it up in 1994, and we're back sort of operating again. And then, look what happened in 1995, another bunch of mud come down, and so they're out of business. And these kinds of events continued long after the eruption's over, up to a decade or more. I mean, you know, there's still these smaller events going on all the time because the river channel that been filled with loose debris and nature is still kind of working its way back going through it. Okay, so this is kind of a summary of what went on at that time. There were probably about a million people at risk from a big eruption of Pinatubo. Uh, about 20,000 areas by pyroclastic flows and asphalt, about 100,000 by the Lars. And as many as 300,000 evacuees got moved to safe ground. But here's the number that I want to, it may sound high, 400 died in the eruption, keeping in mind that much smaller eruption in historical time, one-tenth the size, one-hundredth the size, could cause tens of thousands of deaths. This is remarkable. And a lot of these people died in shelters. They, they were evacuated to shelters, churches, schools. Then that collapsed from the weight of wet ash. Well, so they got moved from where they were, put into a shelter, and the shelter collapsed. And then, of course, they're from measles, and I mean, that's really something else. But anyway, the bottom line here is that, given the size of the eruption, the death toll was remarkably small. That's because we got people on our way. And many, many thousands of lives were saved, and lots of money was saved. For example, Clark Air Base, not only did they move out the 40,000 people, they had a very expensive fleet of jet aircraft there. Very, you know, what's a jet plane these days? Is it 160 million bucks per plane or something? Anyway, they moved out billions of dollars worth of military hardware in time, so it was not destroyed. Okay, so. Are we making any progress? You know, are, are the scientists doing any good by the monitoring studies and advising officials and so on? This graph I cooked up some years ago, which I think convinces me the answer is yes. Okay, we have the 20th century. Of course, in Montpellier, which killed about 36,000 people or more. But this was before there was the science of volcanology. People just really didn't study volcanoes. And, you know, that's an act of God back to nature. The Ruiz was a tragedy that should not have happened. It was a relatively small eruption. Some monitoring was done. Warnings were given, but the emergency management officials failed to act on those recommendations. And people died in their sleep, basically. And here's Pinatubo. So very, very small. And so if you, if you take out this one, which of course it's You'll see there's probably an overall trend that given the scientific studies we can do now, we should be able to save most people lives. Anyway. Now, we can't stop the property damage. That's, that's just the way it is. Now, we had a little bit of luck, too. Here's been a tubo. Luckily, on the day of the big, biggest eruptions, the wind direction was in this direction so that the ash did not fall on Manila and its huge, huge population. So that was just good luck on that score. And now the new crater, Lake, is a very popular hiking destination for the Filipino vacationers now. Now, I've covered very quickly here what I hope were some highlights of the eruption. But if you want to really read the details, 
I recommend you check out this volume. It's only a thousand one hundred twenty six pages. <laughs> But it is online, so you can download the whole thing if you want and read every page, if you, if you wish to do so. Now, but what's more interesting also is that the BBC Nova production people made a great documentary about this. Uh, I think the, the following year, either 1992 or 1993. And in my estimation, having been to a lot of volcanoes, been involved in a lot of situations, see this documentary. It is one of the best that's ever been produced. And not only does it capture the, the, the physical side, the natural side, but it also captures the, the, the Philippine and U.S. <coughs> scientists working through this thing. And it's very human, it's drama. You know, we, so we have scientists who look at all the data and say, well, we think this is going on, but are we right? And what if we're wrong? And that four-star general is going to come after me after he's evacuated all these people that billions of dollars cost. You guys told me it was going to erupt, and it didn't. You know, so all these tensions are there in this documentary, which is really, really fun to see. Okay, so so concluding remarks, and then we can have some time for questions. I hope. Basically. In my biased view, uh, the scientists did very well. It was a highly successful response to the biggest eruption in the world since 1912. The accurate forecast that something was going to blow within three days, and that advice was given to the officials to, to, to evacuate people, was major. It was, it was something was done right. And it also, I think, proved to the USGS at the time that this SWAT team approach of ours actually worked. It actually really worked very well. Now, the ideal situation is for each country to have its own capability, its own volcano territories. But the reality is, when you look around the world, the most dangerous volcanoes are in the developing countries where they don't have the scientific capability or have limited scientific and, as I said before, it was a little bit of luck here that the wind direction was away from Manila. And the forecast that the science made was right on. But, keeping in mind, all of this was done in a matter of four or five weeks. I think most of you, or many of you in the audience are scientists. You know that things just don't go that fast in the world of science. You know, there's a lot more room for more data and so on. We, we used what we could and had. And I think it came out all right. Now, in that documentary that I recommended to you, there's a great scene of this general, who was the commandant, at a scientific meeting, the American Physical Union, later at a big forum of all the principals, the scientists, and the officials, and so on. He actually made this comment during his interview. He says, you know, one of those USGS guys told me, hey, General, put jam in your pocket, General, because we're all going to be toast. And he took that to heart and he evacuated the base. Okay, just to sort of loop back again. What happened at Pinatubo was large, it was the largest eruption since 1912. But again, I bring you back to this diagram, which shows that, yeah, here it is, here's Pinatubo. But compared to something that happened in Yellowstone, in the geological past, or the island of Toba in Indonesia, it was a small eruption, but it just happened to occur in a very densely populated area. So when you get that combination, you've got a real challenge on your hands for the scientific community. And that's it. Many thanks.
we're in a situation where we're in a more isolated volcano. The, the signs did not indicate evacuation was necessary. We took those as training opportunities to train our colleagues in monitoring the volcano, getting the data. Now, we have one instance actually made a recommendation that the, the volcano didn't, didn't perform like it was supposed to. But we have, we have not made that many calls, actually. So, uh, yeah. Uh, do you have any comments on the case of the Italian scientists who uh, have been uh, convicted on this? Yeah, time? yeah. Oh. No, um, that, that split the scientific community, and I think, you know, the seismologists in particular. Uh, uh, you might explain what that is. Um, well, actually, Peter, you <coughs> probably know that situation better. I do. What it is, there was a, 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 a earthquake that took place near, I'm trying to think now. Italy. Italy, no, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a town there, in the city. A, a major city with a lot of ancient monuments, and, and it caused a lot of damage. Some people were killed. No, not Naples, but more into the, 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 uh, the Apennines. Um, shoot. Sorry, but anyway, what, what happened was, there was a committee of the best scientists, best seismologists that they had in Italy. And they were to advise the city government what to do. There were some warning signals. They thought, you know, you know, will a bigger eruption, an earthquake happen because of the smaller one or not? And they basically uh, advised the officials that it was not necessary to do anything, and then the earthquake hit. Then, since that time, there's been a lawsuit filed by the city government against this team of scientists. They were actually convicted, and now they're appealing their conviction, for, for not providing accurate information. Peter, you want to comment on that anymore? All right. <laughs> yes. Uh, there was some charts that you used that had some graphs of seismic energy or something, RDAP. Or RSAM. RSAM. That appeared to be a unitless quantity. Or is there a unit applied to that? It's an arbitrary unit, okay. and, and, and it depends on how you set it up, how many instruments you've got, how you uh, take the amplitudes which you're measuring. So that's the kind of standardized so it's a relative, gain setting and relative amplitude. It's a relative amplitude, okay. and and uh, it's a very quick and dirty method. If you're under the, the gun here, we don't have a lot of time to do detailed analyses, and also with five, six stations using pretty primitive equipment, uh, you know, we did the best we could. Peter, I just want to second what Bob said. The, the video, the killer volcano is outstanding because it takes you through the bit where the scientists are seeing data they think there's going to be an eruption but they're not sure and it carries you through a couple of weeks where you know first the generals weren't listening at all and then they began to listen and it's a wonderful active example of scientists trying to work with the public when a lot of lives are at stake it's an extremely good video we showed it for one of the members' lunches uh, about six months ago or a year ago. But uh, I highly recommend you look that up if you're interested in this issue of how do the scientists without perfect data deal with the reality that 20,000 people could be killed tomorrow. Say you get it, Steve. That, uh, that NOVA special is linked in this week's newsletter <coughs> in the recommended reading viewing section. Yeah, in fact, uh, I noticed that, and thank you for doing that. And it is on YouTube. You just it. type in the Google, and, and you go right there, and it's free. Uh, what about uh, most volcanoes would not necessarily erupt in a catastrophic fashion like that? And what I'm thinking about are the volcanoes near Mexico City. Yeah, Popo can happen over from on. And yeah, um, it's different. And, and uh, in fact, I gave a talk on this kind of topic. What is the reasonable outcome of what we call volcano unrest? <coughs> St. Helens and Pinatubo are kind of one category where they build up in a very short time and they erupt it. They behave, right? <laughs> then you have volcanoes that do this. They ramp up and ramp up like in Rabal, Papua New Guinea. It's stalled. 
kind of flattened off. And for the next 10 years, it did nothing. And then, after 17 hours of earthquake activity, it erupted. Then you have another category of Campi Flandre outside Naples, the big caldera system, that had a period of very, very sharp deformation. The ground was swelling, earthquakes were going up, it had peaked out. You know, they were talking about evacuation to Naples and, and so on. And then it just kind of tailed off and tailed off in the next 20 some years. And now it's starting to come back up. So, volcanoes are not easily manageable beasts. Uh, they, they vary, they're different styles. And, well, they, let's look closer to home here at Yellowstone. And Bob Smith will be talking more about this at the next talk. That, We've had these spikes of earthquake swarms and when the ground is swelled up at an accelerated rate, then it kind of tapers off and goes back to some ground zero thing and, and nothing happens. And the, the, the problem that faces the scientists in this thing, volcanologists, people like me trying to deal with these things, is that the more examples you have with good data and know the outcomes, the better chances you have of making a more reliable forecast. You can say, eight out of 20 times, this has happened. But in the case of a big caldera forming eruption, like we could get in Yellowstone one of these years in the geological future, we don't have a clue. I, 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 I hate to say it, and Bob Smith probably would hate to hear me say it, <laughs> that, that, that we have not had a caldera size, a large caldera forming eruption, since the dawn of civilization. Luckily, luckily, we have, we have not experienced a truly gigantic eruption yet. So, and so we don't have any bases, yet we're studying it. You know, we, we have observatories in Yellowstone, we have observatories in Alaska, and, and we're studying these systems, hoping that we can see some kind of a precursory pattern that a big eruption is likely to have these characteristics. But until we actually capture one live, it's not easy. We saw um, a picture of a blue truck in a cloud when you thought it was overcoming it. About how fast could the cloud be moving and could the truck out? Well, I don't know that from the picture, but you know, I don't know who took the picture even. And I was not even sure that it was June 12th. I just got it off the internet somewhere, quite frankly. But uh, the, the, these flows can go at very high speeds. They can go hundreds of kilometers per hour. In the case of Mount St. Helens, one of these pyroclastic flows actually was supersonic and actually knocked out the seismic instrument. That's how they could time the speed of it. So that truck, my guess was that this was probably a telephoto lens. <laughs> the cloud was probably a lot farther back than, than the picture would indicate. And also, it was probably near the tail end of it as it was swept down and started to slow down. Yes, sir. You showed some very interesting comparisons of, of uh, SO2 output versus ultimate reaction products. And is there some, and probably not exactly, and is that, is the theory, or among the leading theories, is the thinking that that's a function of the other available reaction chemicals in the magma at each site, or temp uh, sort of overall temperature of the okay. ejected material, or what? That's a great question. I wish I had a good answer for that. What you're talking about is that at LC Chone, for whatever reason, the magma had a three to four percent of sulfur, which is highly unusual, incredible, and the speculation that people have for that is that this particular volcano occurs in a geologic setting where a lot of evaporites. So it has come up through a sequence of evaporites and has assimilated you know, all the, 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 the volatile constituents from the evaporites. Now, but there's no way to prove that. Because that's only the, in fact, the LG Chone example is, to my knowledge, has the highest sulfur content of any magma that, I, that I'm aware of. We've been uh, talking about some of your concerns with the volcanologist, one being long in prediction. Uh, but do you have other concerns? Are there uh, areas of the world, some volcanoes in particular, that uh, 
you're concerned about? Okay. Okay, that's a great question. Uh, what's what's the worst case scenario that is a potentially highly explosive volcano in a densely populated region? Yeah. And I have to say, Vesuvius, in my mind, is perhaps one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world. You've got this volcano that is capable of causing tremendous destruction surrounded by four million people. Now, in other situations where you have a very potentially dangerous volcano, but in a very sparsely populated or unpopulated region. Now, the problem there is, and I briefly alluded to this, that a big eruption, even though there are no people living around, can cause a lot of, lot of disruption to aircraft safety and air travel. You know, what, when was it a few years ago that eruption in Iceland caused billions of dollars of economic loss, just trying to canceling flights and relocating routes, and although, you know, there was no real encounters, but it caused a lot, a lot of economic loss. There, there have been some physical encounters between the aircraft and the cash, and it generally just starts to erode things pretty badly, so you can't see out of the well, that's absolutely right. In fact, the, the, in fact, that's a separate talk, <laughs> talk too. But but the, the one of the, the, the biggest, yeah. But there was a famous incident involving a KLM jetliner flying over Java, Indonesia, where all four engines flamed out. I mean, not only breathing the windshield, but the engine stopped because of ash ingestion and melting of ash on the turbine blades. Wow. Okay. That engines, jet engines don't like that. <laughs> and so the pilot had to make an emergency landing, and he did, luckily. And so far, so far, no one has been killed yet, or no fatal crashes of an airplane encountering ash while flying, luckily. And actually, the, the technology is getting much better for that now. There, there are uh, models for tracking the dispersion of a plume that are getting very precise. So the pilots have a much better idea to avoid these things. Now, Bob, you, uh, you yes, commented sir. about how big the crater was after the eruption. What right. Was, what was the size of the crater? Two, okay, two kilometers wide. Okay, just, just to kind of bridge to the next talk, anybody know what the size of the crater is in Yellowstone? Okay, let's hear it, folks. 19 by 25. 200. <laughs> Say what? 200. Yeah. The, crater. The, the, the crater up there is, you know, it, it's not in kilometers, two kilometers or a yeah. mile and a half. Uh, yeah, it's 40 miles one way, 35 miles the other way. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so substantially larger than just a crater. Uh, they had seven seismometers that were just installed. Uh, Yellowstone now has over 20, I think it's 26. And in fact, the last several years, uh, part of what Bob will be reporting on is that they, they've gone to the, some of the latest generation stuff, and which this allows you to actually begin to see what's liquid and what's gas in the subsurface, mm -hmm. which is kind of important because <laughs> those things come out of the ground at a little different speeds, you know, <laughs> things like that. So, uh, right. right. Yes. Question? Yes. How about the undersea volcanoes that are taking place? The events that are not going underwater? Oh, yeah. No, in fact, um, most of the volcanism on Earth is probably occurring along depths of the sea, unseen, unobserved. Where the plates are coming apart, or what we call divergent plate boundaries, and, and with it, the Earth is coming apart and, and material, molten material is coming up between them. And, but because of the water depth and because of the rate that the magma's coming in, most of the time, they don't cause any trouble and people don't even notice it. Unless they're making special studies with diving submersibles and robot ROVs that actually map out, oh, hey, there's a flow here now. It wasn't here last year. You know, something's come up. But there are these situations where in shallower water, you actually get new islands built. You know, if you'll get an explosive eruption, build a little cinder cone and form a new island. 
And that has happened in different places around the Pacific. But has it been a reason for tsunamis that have happened recently, do you think? Is there any, do you have anything to say about that? Well, uh, tsunamis generally involve displacement of land. Okay, what you have is either a big earthquake that displaces a block of land, like in Japan not too long ago, that then the displacement of that big block of the earth that displaces a huge amount of water. So um, most tsunamis are earthquake generated, not volcano generated. Now, sometimes the two can go together, but that's rare. Let's uh, please join me in thanking
break up here, if you would be so kind as to the chairs on this side to stack them against that wall and this side against that wall. And then the final thing is I'd just like to ask you to join me in thanking Bob Tillman for the yeah. talk.